My name is Dare Thorpe. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be your, your moderator for this session and I'm gonna introduce my panelists um, in, a, in a minute. I'm, I come from a world which is a little bit removed from, from the Skull World Forum world, so it's been really exciting for me for the last days to meet so many people who are doing so many interesting things and I'm really excited about bringing a topic of conversation that's really interested, interesting to me, um, data, in, into, this, uh, into this audience. Um, I'm the co-founder of a company called the Office for Creative Research. Uh, we are halfway in between an artist collective and an R&D group, and we focus on, on, on data based in New York City. Um, previous to that, for two and a half years, I was the data artist in residence at the New York Times. And so for the last, uh, I would say, five years or so, most of my thinking has been centered around data, and, and, and very specifically the intersection between data and humans, which is something that I really think is valuable for, for our discussion today. Um, because I'm an artist, though, I'm a, I want to start with a metaphor to help us thinking about, uh, um, about data. Most of us probably flew here in, in, a, in, a, in an airplane. And, and uh, when, you're, when you're in an airplane and when you're in that air traffic system, I think it's one of these very unusual times in our human lives where we relinquish control. We sort of go into these lineups that are, and we see these dense systems around us that we only get glimpses of. We see that we see the baggage disappearing in, into these uh, weird flapping rubber uh, doors, and then they go off to who knows where, and there are these systems around the airplane where they're being fueled and so on and so on. Um, we're, we're part, when we're flying, of a vast system, and it's really almost incomprehensibly large. There are, a, at any given time, there are more than a million people in the air. And the graphic that you're seeing on the screen is this respiring system of um, airplanes landing and taking off on these 15 minute intervals. And, and so for me, this big data uh, world is, is actually really about big systems and, and, and starting to, to be able to communicate with these big systems in a meaningful way. And I know that a lot of you who uh, work in the type of work, the work that you do are involved with very big and very often human systems. And so my hope is that we'll start to understand how this big data world can translate to a better understanding and a better engagement with these types of systems. I also want to talk about what the experience of big data is like. Uh, um, David Foster Wallace, who's one of my favorite writers, wrote uh, um, in, in this memo to his editor, I, I don't know if anybody's ever read the book Infinite Jest, but the book Infinite Jest has footnotes, and sometimes those footnotes have footnotes, and occasionally the footnotes of the footnotes have footnotes. And when he was asked about why he, did, he structured the book that way, he answered uh, partly thus. He said he wanted to mimic the information flood and data triage that he expected to be an even bigger part of U.S. life 15 years hence. And it, Infinite Jest was written 16 years ago. And, and I know that a lot of you are probably dealing every day with this idea of data triage. How, how, can we, how can we take the vast amounts of data that you're being faced with, that you're collecting, that you're able to use, and how can you make some type of, of, of sense with them? Um, the, word, the word data is everywhere. It, in, for me, the change for the last five years has been a really impressive one. Um, I did a check, uh, I, just anticipating this workshop, um, and, and I, I found out that the New York Times has published just under a thousand articles so far this year that have included the word data. <laughs> and if we look at those articles, they're, they're really an assessment of the types of things that people are talking about here. And actually, actually it's kind of the, those little pins, like those little pins are, are being covered by all of these data stories. You know, we have stories about, about health and stories about the environment and stories about education where data is really starting to um, inform all of those things. So we have a huge wide swath of territory to deal with when we're, when we're talking about data. And I thought that I would, would frame the conversation around three uh, uh, pillars, if you will. And, and, um, and, and, and though, before we get into that, though, I think it's really important for us to remember uh, all these stories about data in the, in the New York Times not one of them contains a definition. I think da data is one of those things that everyone assumes that we know what it is. But really, when I ask people, uh, very, very rarely, unless they're in the business, do they have an answer that makes sense. So uh, when I ask people to close their eyes and think about data, there's two things that come up every time. The first is an Excel spreadsheet. And the, the second is that trickle of numbers that was coming down the screen on the matrix. <laughs> Those are the two things that people talk about. Um, but let's, let's start with the, the definition and then move into the three things. And the definition is really simple. Data are measurements of something. 
And I think encapsulated in that definition are two very important things. There's an active measurement. There's something that happens. Somebody's measuring something. And then there's the thing, which in, in, in our case, in many of the cases here, those things are humans. And so to understand that binding between the data and the, and the systems that that data came from, I think, are, are very, very, very important in our, in our understanding and our thinking. So let's, let's talk first about this term big data, because I, I am a little bit allergic to the term big data. Maybe it's because I've heard it so much over the last few years. And, and um, I want us, as we continue, this, as we go into this conversation, to talk a little bit about why, why are we so excited about this term big data? Some of you may, come, may have come into this room with very little engagement with data in your work, but some of you I know are coming into this room with a deep history of engagement with data. So you might have thought, maybe thinking, what, what is the big deal about all this? I've been using data in my business for years and years and years. So what has really happened to change the way that we engage with data? And that's one of our, our focuses. And then I also want to focus on small data a little bit. Uh, let me give you an example. I, I, when I worked at the, the Times, we developed this tool um, called Cascade. And Cascade is a tool that allows us to, um, to, to look at the conversations that are happening around New York Times content. So this is a single conversation around a story called The Island Where People Forgot to Die, which is about um, this island in Greece where people live a very long time, even compared to the neighboring neighborhoods. And so we have this system where we can take any story and we can model its conversation. And we can see where the conversation started and where it went to. The Times has a lot of data. There are 6,500 pieces of, of, of content being created every, uh, every month. And each one of those fosters tons of conversation. So this is, you know, maybe in the big data world, this is medium-sized data, but it's fairly big data. We have millions of data points, uh, hundreds of millions of data points, and we can keep track of all of those things historically. But, but actually, what this tool did, more than allowing us to understand the bigness of our data, was it allowed us to understand the smallness of the data. And my favorite cascade that we identified in this, um, in this whole thing was this cascade, which I call the rabbi cascade. And I call it the rabbi cascade because everybody talking about this story, were, they were rabbis. And this story was about religious workers and why they don't take time off. Because uh, you know, Saturdays and Sundays are not good days for religious workers to take time off. And then they tend to work through the week as well. And so what we were able to find with this tool was this very small conversation about a story about, about religious workers not taking time off that was um, amongst these rabbis. And one of them has the best Twitter name that I've ever heard. It's the Velveteen Rabbi. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and so as we, as we talk about these tools allowing us to get a big scale look at data, let's also talk about what the, uh, the, these tools and approaches can help us with the small grain part of of, of everybody's uh, um, business and everybody's goals, which in some cases, again, are the humans. So you're gonna, you're, gonna, you're gonna see a little bit of a repeat in our conversations. And then the second thing is, is data and value. How, how, how can we really walk out of this room with some better understanding of how you can apply these big data concepts and actually get some value? And I'm gonna break that into two, into two parts. The first is value through analysis. And, 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 and there's a great deal of expertise in, in, on our panel about value through, through analysis. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a data visualizer mostly, and so most of my value when I, when I think about data and data approaches comes through visualization. And I want to give you just a very small example about that as well as, as we move forward. So um, in, 19, in, in, uh, in 2009, I was asked to develop a, an algorithm to help place the nearly um, 4,000 names on the 9-11 memorial in Manhattan. This is a very difficult job and a very interesting human job. And, and the very first thing that I did to help understand this system was to build a visualization. And it's uh, not the, the, the most beautiful visualization ever, but what this visualization did right away was help me understand the problem. And so when we think about analysis as well, I, I want us to think about it on the big scale and also on the small scale and how data visualization and these types of processes that we're going to think about today can help us solve really difficult problems. Um, and, and, and then the, the next thing is, is value through story, which is how, how can, how can um, data help you help us tell stories better? And this is something that, that, that I'm personally really excited about being a visualization person. And I think what this process allows us to do is it allows us to take things which sometimes can be quite dry and kind of br and, and really bring them to life. And, and you know, example of this from, from my own work again, uh, this is a paper that, that NASA published uh, in, in two years ago when they announced the initial findings of the Kepler project, which is a telescope that's trying to find distant planets that are orbiting uh, 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 around, around these faraway stars. And, and um, 
These are the types of graphics that NASA publishes with, with these findings. And to astronomers, these are really exciting, but to us, maybe less exciting. And I think that a lot of, of you probably have data and information that you're, in some cases, forced to present in ways where it's going to be a report to the people who are your funders, and so on, and so on, and so on. So what I'd like us to think about is how can we, um, how can we engage with, with data visualization and, 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 and some data analytic, analytic techniques to help tell our stories better. And in this case, with the Kepler project, um, I produced this visualization which shows the exact same data in a slightly different way. Um, and, 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 and through a really narrative way, we, we get to understand um, what that system is and what that system looks like. Um, I'll let it play out for, for, for just a moment. And, and then I have a third thing. And the third thing was added because Robert and I took the train <laughs> in from the airport on, on the way in here. We had a really interesting conversation about um, past how, how can we use our, our, our data that's maybe in your organization and, and, and combine that data with, with data from other organizations and other sources, how can this, this data thing actually start to really affect and change, change the world? And, and so the third um, part of our conversation today is going to be around this idea of social data consensus. And rather than a project example, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use a quote for this. This is a quote from, uh, um, he's actually a network scientist, um, uh, Lashlo Barabasi. And, 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 and he had this very interesting quote, which I've been a little bit obsessed with o over the last uh, few months, which is, um, do you want to stop different transmitted diseases? Do you want to design better cities? Do you want to stop traffic jams? The data to do so is there in private hands. And we need to identify some social consensus by which the data can be shared with different stakeholders who can take advantage of that. And I think there's a really, really exciting opportunity for the people in the room to be drivers of this, to understand how we can move data um, out, out of private hands and in, into a place where they can help the types of efforts and the things that we're working on. Um, and, and, then, and then really the main part here is I want people to leave with not only some inspiration about the type of work that the people on the panel do, but some understanding of, all right, but how are we going to do this? So how, how is this actually going to happen? So I'm hoping that uh, when we break into questions, we'll be able to, uh, to, to, um, to really, really address that. Um, one of the great things about working uh, with a, with a, with a a panel like this is that I spent the time, some time having conversations with these amazing people and finding out a little bit more about their work. So really what we're going to start off is, is for you to find out a little bit more about these amazing people and their work. So let me do some introductions first of all. Right next to me is Robert Kirkpatrick, um, uh, who is the director of, um, of, uh, of oh, my brain is totally dead, UN, UN Global Pulse. So I, 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 uh, and uh, sorry, Robert. Um, and, and the, the UN Global Pulse works, works very closely with the Secretary General's office to, to uh, do what I think. When I, I show Robert's work to my students as really the clear example of the rubber hitting the road with big data. These are really, really, really the, the best examples of people using capital B big data to help solve uh, capital B big problems. And, and uh, I'm, Robert's going to show us um, a little bit about, about his work, but first let me introduce the other two speakers. So Dr. Jake Corway in the middle here uh, is the founder and executive director of a group called Datakind. And I'll let um, Jake uh, explain Datakind in a little bit more, more detail, because I know I won't, I won't do it justice. And then Sharmila Mulligan, who's the founder and CEO of Clear Story Data. Um, Robert, Robert went rogue. Uh, and, and, uh, and, 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 and he's put together a small, uh, a small set of slides to, to talk about some of the issues that he wants to talk about. So I'm going to let Robert pick up the, right. the PC controller, and we'll switch over to, um, to, to Robert here. Good. Well, thank you. Uh, so uh, as Jared noted, um, I work in a small team inside the Secretary General's office, and New York called Global Pulse. We are essentially a lab for the UN system to learn how to figure out what's happening while it's still happening, um, how to take advantage of all of this real-time information that's out there. Um, the project came out of the global financial crisis when everyone realized that they were trying to understand how the crisis was affecting vulnerable populations around the world, and all the data that was available preset, you know, predated the onset of the crisis. Um, the, uh, the project itself does a lot of work looking at archives of big data. 
um, and seeing what changed in real time a year ago when something happened to a population, and we compare that to the official statistics. So some of you may remember this ad. This is an IBM ad that came out a couple of years ago with uh, chief data scientist um, Jeff Jonas here from IBM, and it, was, uh, it asked a question uh, targeted at the private sector, would you want to cross the street based on data that was five minutes old? Um, you know, now, if you're making stock trades, you're tracking what's happening on your manufacturing floor, um, you're looking to understand instantly what happened, let's say, um, uh, in your operations, you know, the private sector gets this. But in development, we're still using three-year-old data to make five-year plans. Right? Um, we're living in a hyper-connected world where things are changing faster and faster, and yet we're not able to understand what's happening as it happens. So this is a video uh, that is a, essentially a visualization of 300 million tweets over one day in the US from which sentiment has been extracted. And you can see over time uh, people get happier and sadder from one coast to another. Um, people are really happy in Florida. I mean, there's a lot of sunshine there. <laughs> New Yorkers not so happy. That's where I live now with some colleagues here on stage. Um, this is a uh, visualization from the city of Geneva with uh, uh, millions and millions of anonymized call records. You can see every time people make calls or send messages, their location is tracked. And what this shows is how people commute to work. We are a swarming species, for those who weren't aware of it. We shoal like fishes. This is a visualization of financial transactions from uh, Easter weekend 2011 in Spain. Uh, the data was provided in aggregated and anonymized form by the Spanish bank BBVA. This information is out there. It's being generated in real time. We're not using it to understand what's happening to beneficiaries. Our founding hypothesis is that all of these digital services that are out there that people are accessing through $20, smart, you know, $20 feature phones all over the world now are sensors for human well-being. When people's household needs change, they change how they use these services and those changes leave patterns. We need to understand what the patterns are so that we can actually track events as they occur. Um, this is really what Global Pulse is focused on. I want to show you some examples of the kind of information that's out there, um, but this is basically what we're asking. Uh, if private sector can understand its customers and its markets in real time, how can we begin to look at the different sectors that are relevant to our work? So I'll show one example of this. This is from John Brownstein's world, um, and it's sort of using this kind of public big data to track disease outbreaks. Uh, this is from New York, and this is simply people reporting that they or a family member have the flu compared to the official US CDC um, influenza statistics. Some of you may know about Google flu trends and searches predicting uh, disease outbreaks. Twitter is even better um, <coughs> in this case. People say, how can you trust information from people you don't know? Well, there are a lot of people doing this, and they have no reason to lie about having the flu. It turns out to be very powerful. Um, really interesting data here. Mobile phone carriers. Now, they're not tracking your text message or what you, they, you're, they're not recording your conversation. But what they do know is who called whom and when, from what location to what location. This allows them to track how you spend money on your phone. Um, they can see the patterns of communication. Do you call only within your village? Or are you calling other areas? And of course, they can see, as we saw from the video, people moving around on the map. All of us are using maps. We use maps in our work. All over across the UN system, we have thousands of maps. What's missing from the maps? The people. The mobile carriers can see people moving around on a map. They can tell you sleep here, and you go here all day, and you come back. They can see your commute. How far are you commuting? Are you employed? They can make inferences about this. We're doing livelihoods programs, and we have no clue. Turns out uh, work in East Africa by uh, Dr. Nathan Eagle and Josh Blumenstock has shown that, in fact, you can predict people's household income simply by the size and frequency of their airtime purchases. Right? So here we have somebody who spends $10 a month all at once on their phone versus somebody who buys little increments, little scratch cards every couple of days. Turns out that predicts income very, very well. Um, sometimes the stereotypes are true, and here you see differences between men and women. Um, and how they use their phones statistically. Uh, a lot of the algorithms can hit 80% accuracy on gender prediction. They can also predict age to plus or minus three years. Um, very, very interesting stuff because now we can start to make inferences about where a particular population is under stress. This is an example of how mobility can actually be used potentially. This is a uh, work done by Telefonica, largest carrier in Latin America. They looked at the H1N1 outbreak in Mexico City and they looked back at the call records and were able to see 
um, through a mobility index, how much people were moving around with their phones, that after the government said, stop moving around, don't get on the buses, don't spread this, um, people stopped moving around. You can see on April 29th, that was the day of the announcement, and people quieted down. The ability to evaluate a policy response in real time is out there. So we see three types of opportunities in this data. One, better early warning. Two, situational awareness. What's happening right now as I implement my program? And three, perhaps most significantly, real-time impact evaluation. The ability to see collective changes in human behavior in the population where we're implementing can create a new real-time evidence base that can tell us where what we're doing is working or where it's not. We see a future in which development is actually more agile and adaptive. If we're driven by real-time feedback, we can take course corrections and learn as we go and scale as we go and get away from pilots that last two years before we find out it wasn't working the way we thought. So a lot of challenges here. How do we get access to the data? How do we combine it and how do we anonymize it to protect privacy? Right? What are the patterns we should be looking for in the data and how can we actually turn that into action in institutions that are not familiar with this you know, faster, cheaper, but sometimes less accurate information. I'm going to talk quickly about some of these opportunities and challenges. This is how we've been engaging with the private sector for the past two years, a concept we call data philanthropy. Um, essentially, working with these companies to say, look, you're sitting on a gold mine. You're sitting on information that could be used to help people right now. But we've got to find a way for you to share it safely, in a way that's safe for the people, in terms of privacy, and safe for your own institution, your own organization from a competitive standpoint. The response has been nothing short of overwhelming. Companies today get the power of data. They see this as a novel form of corporate social responsibility. And they also understand that if the information they have on how people use their, their services could actually help protect their customers from economic harm, that's good for business too. But it's not really about philanthropy in the end. It's what, uh, it's what Jared was touching on here. We need to move toward a world in which public and private sectors share real-time information in a commons because everybody benefits from this. Big data, we hear a lot about big data and privacy. It's not just a privacy issue, it's a human rights issue. The massive potential of this information to be you know, exploited for harm is out there. <coughs> Part of what we're doing in the UN is really looking at this space increasingly. You know, how do we do this safely and how do we mitigate the risks of misuse of this information? We've been working on a, a data privacy protection framework for the last eight months to inform our work through our labs. Um, this is the debate today around this stuff, right? On the one hand, you have the, uh, you have kind of the, the tech industry saying privacy is dead. And on the other side, uh, you have the regulators saying any, any reuse of my data is potential misuse and it's harm. We want to reframe this debate and insert a third pole into it. Namely, big data is a raw public good. But in order to convert it safely and responsibly into a genuine public good, we have to create a sandbox where we can experiment and learn how to do this. So we're setting up labs. Global Pulse is a lab, and we're establishing labs at the country level. We partner with organizations out there uh, of different types, organizations with technology, with challenges, with data, with ideas. And we do research projects to learn where the signals are. And then we build technology prototypes, open source prototypes, and test these in the field to see if we can actually move the needle. And where we find something that works, that can scale. Um, we have launched so far two labs. Uh, the first launched last year in Indonesia. Um, Indonesia is an amazing place to study <coughs> social media. They're one of the largest users of social media in the world. Pulse Lab Kampala will open later this year. Um, and we'll be opening other labs in the future. Um, a few examples of what we've done just to, to wrap up. Um, this is a project we worked on um, in the end of 2011, actually, where we had a hypothesis that before people lose their jobs, they know something's wrong at the office. And that will change how they talk online about work. And sure enough, we found in these two countries, at least, that between four and five months before you lose your job, we can actually predict the increases in unemployment, just from looking at blogs and forum posts. <clears throat> This is a map of tweets in Jakarta. You can tell people spend a lot of time tweeting stuck in traffic. Jakarta today produces more tweets than any city on earth. Hmm. Um, really interesting place to study this content. Now, people are tweeting a lot about celebrities and sports scores, but when you filter that out, and that's what machines are good for, you get a lot of people talking about food prices and not being able to afford basic necessities and you know, losing their jobs. So an interesting signal. Um, 
HIV, we spend a lot of time funding programs. You're trying to change perception and awareness of the disease. Turns out these technologies for mining big data are really good at measuring that because they were designed to measure the effectiveness of ads. And here we saw when we looked at conversation in World AIDS Day in two consecutive years, a tripling of conversation about HIV and a near doubling of conversation about testing and counseling. So something's working. We looked at food. Indonesians talk a lot about food. Turns out Indonesians tweet a lot about food. We found 14 million tweets about food. The question was, do they tweet differently about food when they're not getting food? So that's Ramadan. Right. Um, when you compare simply the number of tweets mentioning the word price and the word rice, you start to get correlations with the uh, uh, official consumer price index for food in Indonesia. Um, so you start to see some potential for prediction here. Um, <laughs> We've been using a platform, Crimson Hexagon, that came out of Gary King's work at Harvard um, and tracking the online conversation through our lab in Jakarta. Over on the right, that's that little blip around Ramadan. You see that every year. It's baseline. On the left, that's what happened when the soybean uh, supply globally crashed because of the droughts in the US. That's, uh, that's a, real, a real food crisis. Uh, the purple subsegment of that conversation is about people rioting. Um, We've done some comparisons of, uh, around certain topics and moods and have found that we can predict the consumer price index around, in, of food in Indonesia with 89% accuracy simply by mining this out of social media. Um, this is very recent. Um, back at the end of January, the team in Jakarta called an emerging topic. People saying vaccine serum is made in the US. It contains pork products. It is not halal. Good Muslims are not to vaccinate their kids. Whoa. Now, vaccines are halal but what people do or do not know in the village has a huge impact. Mm -hmm. And how, how many conversations in a cafe do you think there are for every tweet that you see? So we've been working closely with UNICEF, who've been in conversation with Islamic authorities in Jakarta about getting the word out and particularly looking at those provinces where you're seeing this, this pattern emerge. So lots of opportunities to get involved in this kind of work. Others in this space are, are beginning to get engaged as well. Um, you'll hear about what uh, what Jake and Sharmila are doing, um, but a lot of opportunities. If you have data, you have tools, you have ideas, you have knowledge, um, or you just like to get involved in a project. Thanks. Nice. Thanks, Robert. Um, I have the same question for for Jake and Charmila because I think it'll help us understand a little bit about what you're what you're doing. I, I when I was thinking about my panel as like a group of, of data superheroes, and maybe the exciting most exciting thing about superheroes is their origin story. Uh, and so um, maybe Jake, do you want to start with the with the with the data kind origin story? Because okay. actually, I was lucky enough to be be nearby when this thing started, and I think there was a there's a really interesting story there and so I'll give you give you a little bit of time to in episode I one that. yeah, yeah right <laughs> film rights are gonna be options soon yeah. <laughs> actually I think you were the one who named the original project data without borders because I described this to Jer when we were working at the New York Times and he said oh yeah kind of like a uh, data without borders I was like that is catchy that's really good um, so I will explain I, that's a great call I guess I'll, I'll go with the origin story um, and I should say it's it's so inspiring being on panels like this because I think it's really bringing home to me uh, especially with people like this, how the world is, is changing and how all of this data that we have in front of us allows us to see these new things. And that ties into my origin story because I came from a, a data science background. Um, I was a, a statistics guy, a computer science guy, but, but long before that, I had wanted to get into engineering because I wanted to build solutions to make the world a better place. And I had all these notebooks full of, of drawings when I was a kid of me building robots to go to space and making cities in the sky. And uh, I didn't quite get there. Um, but you know, that was, that was always this idea that technology could be used to solve these really big problems. And I was super excited to uh, follow a path where I learned computers, I learned data. And right as I was coming out was around 2006, this exciting data moment where it seemed that all the skills that I'd been picking up to make sense of data, to look into technology, were, were finally coming to an age where everyone could make use of them because we were all being flooded by data. Data was, we're all carrying these things around, right? Cell phones that are just emitting where we are, what we like, what we do. What a great opportunity to make sense of that, to learn more about our world. And uh, so I went and uh, you know, got a job working at sort of the, the most uh, forward-thinking place I could find a job over at the New York Times. I didn't quite want to go to a 
a Google or a Facebook, those are great jobs, but they, they lack a little bit of the warm fuzzy. And I thought, well, <laughs> you know, uh, defending journalism is a pretty good, uh, a pretty good way to, to pay the bills. And, uh, but while there, I found something really interesting, which was that the data community, tech community that was growing, was super engaged. They were so excited with what they could do with data, the fact that we could all go home and download all of this government data and spool up 100 computers to count all the words in Wikipedia, just sitting at home in our underpants was incredibly powerful. <laughs> Not to say that's always what we choose to wear, but it happens. And, uh, and, and what was cool was outside of like our day jobs, I would see people gathering and just doing these side projects. And there were even these things called hackathons going on. And I'm actually curious, has anyone been to a hackathon? Oh my God, I love this audience. That is way more than anyone else. So we're amongst friends here. Um, and I can, if you're as nerdy as I am about these things, you're probably super excited. I know I was super excited because I was sitting in this room with all these guys with like amazing computer science skills, amazing, amazing machine learning skills, great data skills. I thought, this is how we're gonna make change. We don't need to be doing this in a company. We don't need a government to come in and do this. We can all do this together. I can't wait to see what we're gonna come up with. And at the end of the weekend, we came up with stuff that was so depressingly <laughs> boring. <laughs> People came up with like mobile apps to find bars, uh, stuff to find <laughs> local deals. I was like, oh man. We have so many skills, and we're using them to make sure that people know what movies to watch or where to get the best deal on Ugg boots. Like, that sucks. <laughs> it's a bummer. And the really cool thing I noticed at the same time was this big, like in big data, that big to me means expansive. There's this realization that everyone's being touched by data and that now even your smallest clean water NGO was being inundated with data from surveys they were digitizing. If they ran a mobile program, they had mobile data. Even if they didn't collect any data, the World Bank and the governments were opening up data about uh, you know, demographics and about that region. There was all of this potential and no one really necessarily had the skills to work on it. So the, the origin story of, of data kind of law, is the long lead into saying, sat down with a bunch of friends in a bar and said, look, we know what we're all doing on the weekend with these data sets. Couldn't we just get like Kiva to lend us their data and we could all just work together and see if we could answer some of these questions or build some really cool things around it? Not reporting stuff, but really answer tough problems. And uh, we put up a blog post to say, hey, anybody in New York want to get together and work on data for good? We'll see how that goes. And before we knew it, we had responses from around the world saying, yeah, let's do this. Let's get it. I want to do that. I, I'm in a hedge fund, and I need to get some karma points. I would love to use my skills for this. Uh, and we, we had NGOs saying, yes, of course, we have tons of data. How can we get people to look at it? And with that, uh, originally Data Without Borders, now Datakind uh, was born. And so ever since, we've been combining pro bono data scientists with social organizations to build teams to say, how can we solve a problem together? Are people itching to do good with their skills, people who uh, are doing good with their skills and maybe could use data better, coming together to make the world a better place. I'll stop there. Thanks, Jake. Yeah, and I, I, you know, I, love, I love this idea of like harnessing the guilt of these people <laughs> who like work for companies and they're in the advertising department and they are, they're these brilliant PhDs, right? And secretly they do want to be changing the world and, and now <laughs> you, what you're doing is giving them an opportunity to do so. So I, I have lots of questions for you, but let's move um, down to Sharmila. Um, right. I, I've been really, really excited to be talking to Sharmila because she has this company which I think is doing something really amazing and they, they're a little under the, under the radar right now and I, I heard of them uh, uh, just sort of first in the last little while. So, Sharmela, do you want to tell us the origin story, the secret yeah, origin absolutely. story of, of ClearStory? Um, so, just uh, my, uh, the start of ClearStory is quite different than Jake's story here, that it did not start with a hackathon or putting a blog up. But what uh, I was doing prior to starting ClearStory is uh, we built a big data platform to allow organizations to store data at scale. And this was at a company called Astrodata um, quite a, you know, about five years ago. And the purpose of that was to allow organizations to basically be able to bring data together from multiple sources but store it uh, at scale at about you know, 90% cheaper what, than what traditional data storage platforms were all about. Um, what happened there, though, was actually quite interesting is our intent originally was literally to offer a new big data platform that was more effective in terms of cost and more effective in terms of you know, sheer performance. It turned out that everywhere we went, whether it was NGO organizations, um, 
large government organizations in uh, commercial enterprise, what was happening is that organizations were actually starting to use the solution to pull data in from many <coughs> different private and public sources and actually make it a data hub. Um, because it was just a cheaper way to actually store a lot of data at scale. So why not start pulling data in from various different sources and store it there, right? Um, so we had uh, organizations that would just basically amass tons and tons of data into our platform. And what happened at that point was that where they'd get stuck was, okay, now what do I do with it, right? So we, it's, been, it's great that we can pull it all together. It's great that one can store it at 90% at cheaper costs. Um, but once it's all in, de in there, how do you actually harness all this data? What do you do with it? How do you extract insights? And that's where things it w became very obvious that there weren't any solutions out there to make it easy to actually bring and converge data together from multiple sources and make sense of it. So um, a lot of what you know, Robert just talked about is exactly the problem that ClearStory was founded to solve, which is really three things. One is we're very focused on enabling you to bring data together from private and public sources. And what we call this is literally data convergence. And it doesn't matter if the data is big in size, small in size. What matters are is the ability to actually source data from trusted uh, public and web sources, bring it into the mix with your private data, and drive what we call a converged analysis. So a lot of the examples that you saw earlier, I think some of those examples were actually examples of sources that you were bringing together, and some of the sources of data that Robert was talking about were more siloed views. So for instance, you can look at Twitter, but Twitter in itself is interesting. However, it's far more interesting when you bring that Twitter data into the mix with other private data that you have access to or other sources of public data. So if you look at the, the very first thing that you know, ClearStory set out to solve is the problem around public and private data convergence, whether it be big data, small data, it doesn't matter. The, the situation everyone is facing right now is that data is living in many, many disparate places, ranging from large Excel spreadsheets to uh, open data that's available over the web to social sources to private data repositories. And looking at this data in silos is not a viable solution long term. It's become critical to be able to pull data together from public and private sources and make it easier to drive what we call data convergence. So a big focus of ClearStory is the process of convergence and the intelligence around data convergence. The second aspect of what we're uh, doing is once you bring data together from multiple different sources and bubble up uh, good trusted sources of public and web and social data and allow you to combine it with private data, the process of doing so and being able to then drive a analysis out of it should not take months to do, right? And the reality is in the past and with the um, pre-existing solutions, it takes a very long time. You have to hire a lot of data architects. You have to have the ability to hire data scientists. They need to know how to converge all this data together, how to normalize it, how to bring it all together. So uh, the other focus of ClearStory is to accelerate the whole process of accessing data and driving to a converged view. Um, in order to do that, again, you need basically you know, new technology, such as the technology we're building, to be able to accelerate and shrink basically the process from the point of accessing data to the point of uh, users being able to see it. So basically shrinking the pipeline. And why, why would you want to do this? It's exactly for the, um, some of the, the reasons that Robert just talked about, is that it's becoming more and more critical to be able to see insights in real time. Um, and real time can mean many different things. We actually like to call it right time hmm. versus real time because real time, um, the notion of real time is that you're seeing it you know, right there every second as it unfolds. But really what we're after in this new world of disparate data is being able to give users the view into the data and view into the insights at the right time. That could mean that some of the data has to be delivered in a real time way. It could mean that some of the data is not coming in real time. However, you need the ability to see it when you need to see it, right? So if there is a crisis or there is an opportunity or there is a flu outbreak, 
you don't necessarily, it doesn't necessarily demand seeing it in real time. It demands seeing it at the right time so that you can take action. So we believe that we need to move to solutions that understand and enable the concept of right time. Embedded in there could be some sources that happen to deliver real time data as well. Um, the third thing that we are focused on, and this was a glaring issue um, when I was at, you know, at my last company and we were in the business of delivering a big data platform, is this notion of ease of consumability. There is almost nothing out there today that makes it easy for a user that doesn't have a technical skill set to comprehend the data and arrive at an insight and know what to do with that insight. So how do you actually basically um, accelerate the process of converging data from multiple sources and then driving to insights and presenting insights <coughs> that users can actually take action on. Um, so we are changing the whole model on the end user side of things as well in terms of delivering a new user model that makes it far more intuitive and far more guided in terms of how you actually deliver a insight to a user and how they actually drive to an insight. And that's where this notion, and that's basically the, um, the roots of the company name. So Clear Story is truly about analysis or data that's being brought together from multiple different sources to deliver a story, but that story has to be intuitive for a user that it doesn't necessarily have a technical <coughs> skill set. Um, the other thing that we recognize in the new user model for, for disparate data is that there are far more people uh, situated across distributed teams that need to see data. There used to be, you know, looking back a long time ago, a lot of the data experts were sitting in the same room and they were huddled together mm -hmm. in the same location and you, can, you could basically, you know, exchange ideas and pick each other's brains and understand basically how to draw insights of the data. We're in a very different world now where people are bringing data together from many different sources. They're located in many different locations and these distributed data teams need, and users, need a better way to be able to see <coughs> insights and share insights and understand basically what to draw out of it. So um, there are really three things, like I said, that Clear Story is very focused on, is this notion of public and private data convergence. In fact, in the public realm and web, web data uh, realm, there's about 8,000 open <coughs> data APIs. And if you look back around eight years ago, there were about 50 open data APIs, right? If you look at the um, sources of uh, uh, social data that are good social indicators, there are about 370 options out there right now for good trusted sources of data. Um, we recognize that nobody can actually filter through thousands and thousands of sources themselves and that you need to be able to bubble up the trusted sources of data, the high quality data, and then, draw, ma then make it possible to drive this convergence. Um, accelerating the process to do that, as I just talked about, and finally, really delivering a new user model so more users can actually work with data than what we've been dealing with in the past, which is just relying on data experts or small groups who, are, who basically have the expertise to do so. Um, in delivering the new user model, we basically bring into it a lot of um, uh, concepts from the consumer world and what, what has happened in terms of consumer applications. And as you know, many, consumer, many applications have become a whole lot easier to use because of certain innovation around it, bringing a lot of those ideas into the world of data and making it easier for users who have non-technical skill sets to actually work with data. Great. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna cross my legs this way to, to, to turn into <laughs> mean moderator. Um, uh, Robert, you work, you, work with, you work with data that, that um, is collected through social networks, that is collected through uh, various, various ways in which most often the person who's providing the data isn't aware of what you're doing with the data. So, you know, there's a term for that which we call opportunistic sensing, right? It's like mm -hmm. you're, 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 you're using people's data. Um, somewhere in the nine-page user agreement that they signed said that their data becomes public, but I'm not sure a lot of the people who are using the systems kind of understand that their data is being used in that way. So I just want to ask uh, how you guys negotiate as a, as a governmental or as a, as a big, big global organization. How do you negotiate that, that, um, that ethical quandary of, sure. of using people's data without them knowing that you're using it? 
Well, I think we're in, in the, at the beginnings of a paradigm shift that will ultimately be about not companies giving, <laughs> putting other, putting customers' data into a commons, but individuals being empowered to actually decide how their data can be reused. That's the world we want to get to as soon as possible. Um, we don't, in our research, we don't actually ever receive personally identifiable information mm -hmm. of any kind. I mean, we're looking at the policy dimension. So we're looking primarily at aggregated data. We're looking, we only receive data that's been anonymized. Right? So we're, we're not trying to, to, to find out that somebody lost his job and had to sell the family cow. The okay. idea is really, okay, there's been a 300% increase in attempts to sell livestock in this district. That's where we need to go do the next household survey mm -hmm. right now. So we're really looking for patterns and anomalies in aggregated data. Um, you know, you can do a lot with data yeah. that, that has identity in it, um, but the risks are too huge. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I ask is because I think that you guys uh, um, are doing such great things, but if, if Google were to say they were doing very similar things, people kind of, there's an outcry that happens there. there. And what, what, there is. how do you see the difference there? Well, there's research on this. I mean, it's interesting. If Facebook tells you you're 70% likely to break up with your girlfriend next Tuesday, people feel very invaded. Right? There are algorithms that will do this. Um, but if Amazon says, you know, people who bought this book also bought that book, we like it. If Google searches predict flu outbreaks, we see the public good. In other words, you know, individuals, as individuals, as producers of data, um, we may not all be as educated as we should be about how our data is being sold behind our backs and moved around the world and used to make a lot of money, but what we do understand is that you know, the data has potential, and if I see the benefit of it, that changes how I weigh the risks and benefits of reuse. What we're trying to get to is to say, you know, there's this huge opportunity in this data. It's not just about commercial profit. We need to be more educated, and we need to generate evidence that you can use it for good, because that will get to a more nuanced conversation about right. the applications. Right. And, and, and actually, that ties into a question for Shamrilla, which is um, uh, data as property. We, we, uh, I'm very interested in the idea of data ownership and, and the idea that, that me using my cell phone, producing data on, on that cell phone, the, you know, the, legal, the legal boundaries are fuzzy, but they, they are more often than not in the, in the favor of the user and that 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 information that's being created is the user's data. However, there are many, many companies, many of which you probably partner with, who, who hold that data and they count it as, as property of the company. So right. I guess I have, I have a question about, about in your interactions with the companies that you partner with, is this something that those companies are thinking about, first of all? And then second of all, how do you think we could, or do you think it's worthwhile to even get to that point of Robert's um, uh, Data, data commons, is there going to be a point in which these companies will be more open to share their data with the knowledge that that data can help yeah. the world? So um, great question. So what we're actually very sort of pleasantly surprised to see is that a lot of the companies that have been in the business of providing high value data are very interested in seeing their data cross pollinated with other data sources because they appreciate that if you could take that data and cross-pollinate that data with other sources of data, you're gonna to drive to richer insight. And they're all driving towards trying to find out how to get out of just the data brokering business into the business of insights. And to get into the business of insights, that means opening up their data and making it more consumable and easier to cross-pollinate. Now, um, one of the things that's putting pressure on these, uh, these companies to do this, where previously they were sort of protecting their data closely, is that what's happened across the web and social sources is that, look, if you are not going to open up your data, there are other places I could go that didn't exist before, right? Mm -hmm. So previously you went to sor trusted sources of data and they were the only places you could go if you wanted wanted it, and now there are many more options. As I mentioned, there are thousands of places that you could go to across the web to pull interesting data out. Now, granted, you have to look for the data quality and the trusted sources. There are sources now, like social data sources, where you can get very interesting insights out of it, and it's not you know, pr uh, tightly held, right? So we are at a place now where a lot of the phenomena that has happened over the web and social networks is placing pressure 
on other providers of data to open up their data and make it more readily usable mm -hmm. so that you can cross-pollinate it with other sources and drive to an insight. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say that this transition has you know, completely happened yet. It's, in, it's happening and we're seeing it unfold in front of us. But, and I, we believe that it will happen. Um, and we believe that the phenomena across the web and with social networks is actually accelerating the, the movement from you know, companies protecting their data very closely to making it more open. The other thing I would add to this is that as, um, whether it's NGOs, government organizations, commercial enterprise, as they look at data from third party sources and social sources, they themselves are very interested in a mechanism to share data of, of interest, right? So I find a source of data, I mash it up with another source of data, and I've now created basically a mash data product. If there's something interesting in that, I should be able to now share that in a data marketplace, essentially, with others that might find it of value. So, um, and I'm sure actually with you know, what, what you do and a lot of the data that you look at, this interest in actually making it shareable and opening up a marketplace where more people can get to it mm -hmm. is probably becoming you know, of high interest. So we're seeing two phenomena is that there is, you know, data, data providers are transitioning over to make their data more easily available so you can cross pollinate it. And they're from the user end of it, there's a big pull towards making data shareable in a marketplace as more people find high value sources of data. Thanks. Um, we're going to open up to, to, to questions from the room in a second, but I want to end with, with a question for Jake because um, I, know, I know that many people in this audience have organizations that are probably very eager to, 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 to get working with DataKind. This idea of, of, yeah, awesome. of these really world-class data scientists parachuting in <laughs> uh, like, some, like a strike force of some kind to like, help you solve your data problems. How, how, do you balance, how do you balance this, I think, this really excellent, excellent mechanism you have with the very, I think, problematic question of domain mm. expertise, right? Mm. So there's the, all these people who have been working on these problems for years, and yeah. in comes your team of of data ninjas, uh, what what do you do to like to make that accelerate that like years of learning into a into like a very th that's something I've, I've been very interested about that's, about about data. Coding. We've never met before. Right? That's a it's a great question, um, and also I've never heard of data scientists referred to as ninjas or like strike forces. It's usually kind of rebranding, yes. man. I'm yeah, sorry. right. Exactly. Yeah, the new heroes. Um, but I, I think that's an awesome question um, and one that we had to address very early on because what you'll see is that. There's almost a geek hubris in the data science community. And you'll hear things like, let's hack education and let's yeah. hack government. Yes. And that's this flip idea that technology can solve everything and the technologists have the solutions. Mm -hmm. I think we recognized very early on that while we may be very good with technology and data, we don't know all the problem areas we're working in. I don't know the issues in poverty or clean water. And so we started very early on with real, what we feel are real collaborations between organizations and data scientists to say, not just, oh, toss us your data and we'll tell you what's in it and give it back, but really sitting down with people and saying, what are the big issues here? What, what's really you know, troubling you? And there's this amazing I don't, like, interaction, this, this almost two-step that happens when these projects start, where uh, it usually goes something like this. An organization walks in and says, uh, I have all this data. What do I do? <laughs> That's usually where it starts. And the very first thing that you want to say is, you know, with these data scientists there is to say, you know, it's funny, it's, it's actually not at all about the data. I shouldn't say not at all, but it's not really the place to start. It actually really starts with the questions that you want to answer. So what, what you, the question we usually ask is, what sucks most about what you do every day? <laughs> yeah, what's the heart, right? I'm sure everyone has an answer to that, like, ugh. I hate that I have to look through all these hundreds of files by hand, or I hate that I have to find uh, you know, that I'm always wondering how people are using our programs. I have no idea until the next survey comes out next year. Um, and so from there, there's this funny little back and forth where the data scientists will take the data and say, okay, given what you said, I think we could do X, Y, and Z with this data set. And they go, oh, that's, that's funny. I didn't even think of X. You know, Y and Z aren't important, but that makes me think of this other thing that we have data for. And it goes back and forth in this really great way to where you get this kind of melding of the subject expertise, what really matters, and how something would be used with the data scientists who can bring in sort of the ideas and creativity about what's possible. Mm -hmm. So that's something we emphasize a lot, is that partnership in the right. process. 
Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so let's open up to questions. And, and, yeah. and uh, I just ask that, that when I point to you for a question, like the first question we're going to take from here, you just wait for the microphone because we're recording and, and uh, we'll, hear it, we'll hear it more loudly. So the first question will go to the lady in the red. Um, hi, I'm Carol Cohn from Edelman. Um, there is over $131 billion spent in advertising. Mm. And there's always this joke, you know, 50% of advertising works and 50% doesn't. I've spent my entire career trying to show to companies that if they adopt social issues and if they have the right connections and communications, that they can have a deeper relationship with their employees, their communities, current customers, and future customers. So my question to you is this. A lot of the data um, is either held by manufacturers or retailers or Nielsen or such. Is there some way, not that we'll answer it today, but is there a way that you can take data that if a company is standing for something and it has begun to be on package or communicated or socially, that it is more powerful and so they can stop spending their $131 billion in advertising, put it into more of the social issues engagement, and have much more effective <laughs> relationships, business plus social purpose. Hmm. Yeah, I, yeah we're, we're certainly seeing that kind of consciousness emerge in the organizations that we're engaging with, partly because you know, their customers are more data savvy today. Mm -hmm. They understand data, uh, the people that they're recruiting are millennials, mm -hmm. right? So they're coming in and they're saying, yeah, I want to do well, but I want to do good too. Um, the, the, the business model that's driving a lot of companies today is the data produced by the old business model, right. which is more, has higher margins than the old business model. Um, and you know, we, we've seen, for example, in our discussions with uh, the telcos in Indonesia, we have all 10 telcos at the table in discussions about pooling all data from past years into a commons and stripping out the company name and making it safe to work with. Um, and they're saying, you know, we want our data scientists, not, we don't want to give you our data and just, you know, let it go. We want to actually co-design the research projects mm -hmm. and get our people involved because it's a huge morale boost. Mm -hmm. And if, the, you know, if our, if our subscribers know that we're actually using aggregate data to understand, you know, migration to cities and the impacts of rising food prices, that's a win for the company. So there's PR here and there's morale here. Um, I, I always say that there's a, there's a good space for companies to, to brand themselves as data ethical in the same way that we saw happen with, yeah. uh, with the sort of green ethics and, and, and companies who branded themselves that way. And I've, I've been wondering for a while who would be the first to do that. <laughs> uh, my name is Chris Atwood. I work for the Salesforce Foundation, salesforce.com. So, I mean, we, we wrestle with this because we have 18,000 not-for-profits that use Salesforce, and we, that's a big data set. So we wrestle with how do you get them connected, and then Clear Story is interesting. I was Googling the technology. I'd be curious to see how you can pull some of that stuff out of Salesforce and you know, connect the data with Radiant 6 and stuff. But that's one of the things that we sort of wrestle with. We love to see more of it. We're just not sure how, because we actually, you ne actually need to get the not-for-profits to agree to share their data mm -hmm. to then run the report. So I'm actually seeing the opposite right now. When, as I work with big not-for-profits, they mm -hmm. don't want to share their data because it's, you know, it's very proprietary. Data as property again, right? Wouldn't yeah, the only example that I've seen, just a specific example, is we work really closely with Homeless Link. So it's a membership association of homelessness organizations in the <laughs> UK. And the big lottery funded this project to do data analysis around you know, homeless people, homeless services. And, and they're getting data out of Salesforce, out of other sources as well. And then they're doing a research project that the big lottery fund here in the UK sponsored. But, you know, that's, you know, one of the few examples I can think of with shared data pools with, you know, specific, you know, anonymized customer data. But, you know, we've got a lot of customers with a lot of data. It would be cool, you know, if the not-for-profits would share some of that data and run some neat reports. I wanted to just uh, address the particular sure. question there, um, your question on um, the effectiveness of, you know, advertising and showing that if it's put towards, you know, social issues that consumers actually respond better. So there was, um, so we have actually, with Clear Story, sort of shown companies that if their ad dollars are put towards that cause, there is actually a better market response and consumer adoption. And um, interestingly, there was one, there's one very large consumer packaged good company that did a big campaign. And instead of using the traditional advertising channels, they actually used the social channels 
to promote a campaign around you know saving water in certain locations and so it took on it was a very very well designed campaign of course driven by their own sort of creativity around it but the response to it was phenomenal and phenomenal and the response actually could be measured through the social channels as people were across the world starting to respond to this campaign which then got you know certain products flying off the shelf that were very sort of eco savvy eco friendly products and that in turn i think you know clear story was you know is a platform that lets you look at all this data from multiple sources and be able to measure what's working where right um, and that is, and, and the other thing you're doing in that particular example is looking at everything geo to geo and by population and by demographics, who is responding to what. Um, and so that's an example of being able to demonstrate to organizations that if they do put ad dollars towards these type of campaigns and advertise in that way, it likely is going, it does have a very positive effect. But again, and, and this is back to measuring Right. right, your one of your three points is you know not just about collecting the data, but measuring the effectiveness. Right, right? and down to every location, geo, zip code, population to see how people are responding. Right. Um, we we shockingly are running out of time in our in our first mm. period of this. We're <laughs> going to continue, but I want to take one one more question on camera, and then and and then we'll all loosen up and 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 and. <laughs> get more sure. rowdy once the camera is <laughs> done. Uh, I don't know who was ha hand up first. I saw you first, so we'll go to the, the microphone to the top. Hi, I'm Mark Chalmer from ACVO. Um, I, wondered, I, I wanted to get a sense from the panel of uh, what proportion of the smartest and brightest people most active in this space are currently working under ad advertising-funded <laughs> business models? And I, I wondered what we can do to, I mean, obviously, that might be okay, but I suspect it'd be better if we had a lot of them working under alternative business models. But I just wondered what proportion you think it is and what your thoughts are on that. Jake? Um, the, I don't know an exact number, and I hesitate to put any data out that I couldn't back <laughs> up. Uh, but I would say the vast majority. Uh, and the question I, I have back, actually, is you mean company, like companies that employ data scientists that are, make the revenue around advertising-based models, and how would we change like Google's model to be off advertising? Or how do we get people who currently get six-figure jobs in advertising to go elsewhere? No, I mean, you know, are they working in organizations that are really interested in this? But ultimately, when you really look at where does the money come from, yeah. it's coming from advertising. Because that will always sully, it will always affect it. Interesting. Um, I don't know, you may have, yeah, yeah you've well, I mean, There's a, a data scientist, uh, Joseph Turian, who hears this talk called Doug gray hat data science and black hat data science and he said we haven't seen like the really catastrophic use of data science yet for harm but ev almost everybody working in the space is in a sort of ethically murky <laughs> field yeah. because at you know at best you're trying to change human behavior to get people to spend more money this is why you know certainly in the un we're getting some of the you know these people are typically recovering particle physicists uh -huh. right? Um, and they're hugely interested in doing this because like you can figure out how to get people to click on ads or you can fight hunger, poverty, and disease. I mean, we can't pay what the Googles pay, but there's a lot of interest out there and it's, it's because the vast majority is solely focused on advertising. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, I think we have time for one more question. So before we go, before we switch the camera off, so we'll, we'll go over here. My name is Mitchell Strauss. I work for a government development agency called OPIC, the Overseas Private Investment Corporation. And for years I've thought about a, a ninja hackathon strike force. A ninja hackathon strike force. <laughs> Glad we got that on video. Especially as it pertains to the work we do here when we come together at Skoll. And that is that I perceive this great number of people that want to give or invest money, mm. products and services, and themselves, people. And they want to connect to things that are good and vetted, yet simple. And they are across impact sectors, agriculture, healthcare, all the things that we care about in development. But they don't know how to connect. 
And if there were to be a Google map that would go down to the, the block, and if it was not so heavily laden with data that people would seize up at the thought, but rather someone anywhere, any time of day, wants to give $800 from its church group to fight poverty among children in their village in India, how do we connect those two dots with just a simple transporting dot to another website? How hard would that be? That's, I think it's a great question, and I know a related answer. I know Kiva people are sitting here in the audience who I know are trying to match up donors directly to people who need that around the world. So it's clearly possible and more than possible successful. Um, I think the challenge, and there may, I'm sure there are other giving groups that people in this room must know that allow you to find groups that you but want to donate to. If you don't come here and you don't know the word Kiva, how do you do that? Hmm. So there is no one mega site. <laughs> <laughs> There's no one site that ties all the other sites together. If you don't know the word root capital, you're not going to necessarily get to the smallholder farmer. And even, this is the big secret of all time, if you work in a major G8 development finance institution, you don't know necessarily who from government, who from the private sector, and who from the world of the not-for-profits is active fighting mm. malaria in a given place. And yet if we all knew that together, we could save so much money and we could take away the time that NGOs and others spend just trying to figure that out mm -hmm. and redeploy that money. And I think it is like a couple of dollars. Yeah, no, it's, <laughs> it's, a, it's a great point. And I think some people in this room may actually be working on a preliminary data problem to that, which is that as of yet, there's not a unique identifier for each charity or nonprofit or social cause, yes. at least that I'm aware of. And that starts as an inhibiting factor because then, Everybody's got to go on and say, I'm this charity, and I'm doing this, and they've got to keep it up to date. And now you run into all the data problems that everybody hates around any kind of reporting. You have to have some interns sit there and update that all the time, and it gets old and stale, and no one uses it. So there's actually a great effort out there now uh, to create one consolidated, almost like the tax number used by uh, corporations, uh, for all NGOs or charities around the world. Now, that's not going to immediately solve that entire problem, but I think that's an exciting data problem that gets you one step closer because now you get to say, here are all the NGOs operating, and maybe the next step is, here are all the ones working in these topic areas, and here's where they're located, because that all has to go in on tax forms and registration forms. So I'm very uh, uh, bullish about that, that movement, and people should watch the, the guide stars and the, <clears throat> the IRS and people like that, at least in the US, that are working on things like that. So there's hope, but I agree, we, sh we should see that. Um, so, so just before we transition, uh, we have one minute left on camera. We're going to go to we're going to continue questions in a second, but um, uh, big this word big data drives me crazy. So we're talking about rebranding. Look, I, 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 my friend Sanan Aral always says that it's not about big data; it's actually about granular data. We're getting the data the data points are smaller, and we have more of them, and that's what's <laughs> exciting. So granular data it's not going to sell, but, but <laughs> if you had to uh, rebrand big data with a word. S well, something data, what will it be? <laughs> well, it could just be data, but there's a lot more of it. I think, well, <laughs> well if, you, if, you, if you realize people are all around us doing all these transactions and producing the data, and it's coming from mobile devices, the data is passing through our bodies right now. Gigabytes of data is passing through your body as you sit here. Ambient data. Ambient data. I like it, Jake. Feel it. Well, I, I'm a big fan um, of the slow movement, so I'm looking forward to slow data, slow data. artisanally. <laughs> Artisanally crafted uh, yeah, yeah. data. You're from, you, you also live in Brooklyn, which makes. Oh, this is true. I'm biased. I'm biased. Sure. Sure, uh, uh, oh, diversity. Fancy. So data diversity. Data. I think that you know it's about just more and more sources, and that's only going to get worse. Um, there's going to be you know more sources to tap into. Just like I said earlier, it doesn't matter what the size is, small okay. or big. All right. So um, now the camera is done, we can swear freely. So um, uh, let's go to the back for a question, hopefully laced with profanity. 